Hi guys. I hope you guys can hear me. Um, can you just drop a comment if you guys can hear me so that I know everything is working fine? Okay, we're already live. Um, for some of you who are live or some of you who are trying to check in, um, just let me know if you guys can hear me, but we're gonna get started in a bit. I'm just waiting for everyone to be online, but welcome back to the Afro Boss Lady Show. Um, we're gonna get started in a few seconds. Okay, I think we have some viewers, but um, it looks like nobody is dropping a comment. So I'm guessing I, I will get started. Um, so welcome back to the Afro Boss Lady Show. This is your host, Jenny. Um, today we have episode seven of domestic, talking about domestic violence. This episode is really gonna have lawyers and law enforcement officers. Um, I wanted this e episode to happen because as you guys may know, or some of you who may not know, um, the Chris Takam case, um, the Cameroonian couple that actually died. Um, if you guys have an idea what I'm talking about, then you pretty much know what happened. But for some of you who don't know, um, Basically, Chris Takam, um, late Chris Takam. Oh, I see some comments here. Vivian Boluda. Okay, awesome. So um, the case, um, they were actually, that was actually a couple that was married and they decided to get a divorce. The woman decided to get a divorce because apparently she was going through domestic um, abuse. And that led to the husband later on killing her and killing himself. So I'm going to invite all my guests so that you guys can get to really know them. And we're going to get, uh, we, we're going to go ahead and get started. I see more people coming in. So awesome. Hi, hi, hi. Hello. Hi. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. <laughs> hi, James. Hi. Welcome, welcome you all um, to my show. Today is going to be an episode where we talk about domestic violence. As you all know, um, the Chris Takam case. So my first question is, what's your thoughts on that? Um, just just to give you a background for some of you who may not know, um, he is a Cameroonian who was living um, in America and he came with his wife and children. They had three children together and things did not work out. The woman was actually, the, I mean, she was actually abused at home. So she went ahead and asked for a divorce. But unfortunately later on, the guy couldn't bear the fact that she was dating somebody else. I mean, I'm just paraphrasing, but I'm guessing it, in a nutshell, she was dating another man and he killed her and killed himself um, as well. So what's your thought on that? I can start with Mary Ambanka. <laughs> okay, hello everyone. Um, is that a disconnect with the volume? Um, I think I can hear you perfectly. I can hear you well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You know, I'm I'm in Douala, Cameroon. The network sometimes plays a trick on us. Yes, yes. And so, okay, thank you, Jenny, for inviting me. Um, yeah, I'm a lawyer in Cameroon, and um, I'm an activist. I'm so many things, and so. This particular case caught my attention 
Um, for me, it was like, what madness is that? I've never heard of a case where a man kills his wife and then commits suicide. And then there were Cameroonians, and you know how our Cameroonian community, well, we were not really brought up thinking of such tragedy, you know, like you kill your wife and you kill yourself. And then, well, this is the pandemic, the corona and stuff, and everybody's like, or I was like, how can you do such a thing during this period? Like, you were not even scared, and then now your children. Did you think about those children before you did such a thing? Because I'm a mental health advocate and everything, my mind just went straight to mental illness. So I didn't even need to know the exact fact of what the woman may have done and everything. I was like, well, this man is not. So, well, eventually I came to realize that from the various posts he had been doing and what his friends said and from the facts, you know, the police uh, report which I read, I was not so much on today, yesterday on social media, I could really conclude also being a psychotherapist that this man had issues. And so, well, that is how it ended for, for the wife and for him. And now the children have all of this trauma to deal with and the yeah. community too. And many women are now scared of like, am I safe? Including myself. <laughs> yes, because you never know. Um, Attorney James April, do you have, uh, what, what's your thoughts on this case? Uh, I mean, what happened, I was, I've, been, I've been a criminal defense attorney for over 24 years now. I do domestic violence cases on a daily basis. So to me, the facts and the scenario is a, tip, is a prot protocol, typical, typical uh, case involving domestic violence where I think the guy's frame of mind is I brought her to America, therefore she's my property, she's my property. I will not let her go. That is not the right way to do it. It's not the right way to do it. And I think that's the essence of this show for us to be able to help our community, all right? The constable is here. He'll go into that. Help our community and avoid situations like this, you know? So it's a very sad thing, right? The wife should have spoken out. He too should have sought help somewhere, but it's a typical case. Uh, and bye. Yeah, that's okay. Well, I think uh, uh, um, Mr. Bangman, um, uh, uh, Ms. James hit the nail on the head. Uh, there's just this thing I want to put across that domestic violence or family violence is not something that is common only to, to Cameroon or only to Africans or Sub-Saharan Africans. It is uh, something that transcends culture. It transcends uh, race. It transcends every fabric of a society in, in this whole world. And um, you might have heard of um, honor killing. Honor killing is something which is typically Middle Eastern, which is a case where, say, for example, you have an immigrant family from Iraq, see, they are in the United States, and then at some point, maybe um, the female in the family, the girl child gets out of the religion and starts living the Western lifestyle or maybe gets pregnant without getting married. We have seen cases where the boy child has taken it upon themselves to kill the female for bringing disgrace to the family. So that's what they call uh, honor killing. All right, I just had to extrapolate on that to bring to the fact that this is something that's common in all cultures, not just ours. Um, the, the part that really concerns us is, you know, when something hits close to home, then people start getting alert, like what is really going on? Then they start looking around. And the same situation that happened to the Takams has been happening before around here. Uh, Texas, uh, Dallas is very popular with these stories about, you know, Nigerian men um, trying their best. That's always a story. They bring maybe a female across as their loving wife. And then once the wife picks up uh, a good job and uh, most, most of the time they, 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 they get wings and they can fly away. All right, this, this is some background, but the thing I want to, I want to be very unequivocal, um, nothing in this world justifies the fact that you can take another human's life. Uh, it is weakness, and uh, there's not enough words to describe it. So, um, but again, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't happen in one day. There are those signs that we miss. There are those little things that add up and add up and build up up to that point. It is only when it finally happens, like in the Takam's case, that's when people start saying, oh, I noticed this. Oh, I noticed that. 
this should have happened, I should have done this. So it's all the way bad. And uh, I just had to expand it a little bit to make people sure know it's not something that's common only in Cameroonian. And Mary, um, I'm back. Uh, can you just um, tell people who you are and what you do? Because I know um, you yourself have been a um, victim of domestic violence. So just briefly explain to people who you are and what you do. Okay, well, just call me Marie. Don't bother Marie. about the other name. Okay, fine. So um, I'm a mom, I'm a woman, I'm a lawyer, I'm a psychotherapist, I'm an author, I'm a motivational speaker. I founded an association two years ago called Hope for the Abuse and the Battered. And uh, we have four main focus areas, um, hope for victims of domestic abuse and gender-based violence, hope for persons living with a mental illness or mental health challenge, hope for children, um, victims of adverse childhood um, experiences, and emotional wellness. So yeah, I'm pretty much cut across so many um, fabrics of the society and issues that go on. Like rape, I'm very passionate about, um, I've worked with a lot of children, victims of rape, and women too, victims of domestic abuse, a few men too, so, yeah, personally, of course, I've been a victim and I had to leave my own marriage in 2011. So this is something very, very, very close to my heart. And in your experience working with those victims, what, is some, uh, what, what are some of the common signs that they always say? And even you yourself, what are some of the common signs where somebody always says, I saw it happening the first time and I thought it, he was going to change? What would you say about that? Well, in my case, I, I talk a lot using my personal experience. I've documented. I have no problem with that. It started with the neglect, the emotional neglect. And then it moved on to, uh, to the emotional verbal abuse. And to be honest, we started abusing each other, you know, verbally. And then when the verbal now was not enough for him, it, it became physical. It did not become, in my case, it was not too much physical in a way that when it happens in January and it doesn't happen again up to June or December, you are like, what? Well, so he's changing or, you know, stuff like that. And then it happens again. And then, well, people don't really believe you because in my case, he was looking like an angel. And some other people, I just attended a live video on Facebook and we're talking about domestic violence and some people were like, yeah, well, he was really looking like, sometimes they look like angels. Yeah. And in Chris Takam's case, if you look even at his picture, right, doesn't he look like a peaceful man? I don't know. I, I think he looks like a peaceful I man. I, I remember in the beginning, one, what actually struck me in the beginning of this um, entire case, when um, he first, I mean, when it was first announced that he killed his wife and he killed himself, is automatically the blame was put on the woman because people have found pictures of her um, and her partner, her white partner. And the story came out that, you know, this is what happened when you bring a woman from Cameroon and she comes here and she cheats on you. So that was one thing that I was like, it's really um, interesting how instead of just blaming the perpetrator or blaming the victim, um, I mean, not bl blaming the perpetrator, we always go to the victim and say, what did she do? So, Attorney James, James, what, what's your thought? I mean, you've yeah. been dealing with those type of cases forever, yeah, so, for so many so let years. Me, let's, define, let's define family violence. First of all, <laughs> family violence, it's not only about husband and wife. Yes, family exactly. violence involves members of your household and members of your family. So, what does that mean? That means you can have a home with four kids and a nanny, and you guys are abusing that nanny. That nanny is part of your household, and that is part of family violence. Yes. Okay. So uh, family violence does not only affect men, or men being or men being the perpetrators. I've had cases here in Houston. I don't want to call names because Constable Ebay will know some of them. <laughs> been accused by women because they want to get papers. Okay. The woman accused the guy, we went all the way to court, went all the way to trial, and the case was, was the jury came back with a not guilty verdict, okay? Why? Because she wanted to use that as a means, all right, to get her papers. Another example that I had, 
Another person that constable knows very well, very, very, very well, was married for over 15 years, had five kids. This woman was constantly cheating on him. She will go that she's going to work and she will leave and she will go to uh, Minnesota or Boston and spend time with the boyfriend. So one day there was an incident where he recorded her and when he played the video and said, okay, fine, I'm going to expose you. She decided to set up this scene of her being assaulted by the husband. Now, I'm not saying that domestic violence does not occur. It does occur, but there are people too who are charlatans. There are people too who are fake, very, very, very fake. Because for example, the husband goes out, he comes back at two o'clock in the morning. He has had a few beers. You want to control him. You want him to stay at home. You say, okay, fine, where did you go to, right? Uh, an argument ensues. I mean, the officer will go into it. An argument ensues. And then you push him, right? He pushes you back. You pick up the phone. You cry. The police comes. He assaulted me. The first question that the officer is going to ask the woman or the victim, well, did you feel pain? Yes. Immediately you say, yes, I felt pain. That's domestic violence in Texas. You are gone. So uh, I, let's understand that it transcends both genders, male, female, female, male. And, so, and 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 even children um children yeah but and i don't want the the the, the thing with this topic is this right when we talk yeah. about violence um more time than often women are always the victims if you go into construct of africa right for example um many 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 women and Mary can works with these women and she knows exactly the situation in Africa. So in terms of the numbers, and I think that's why every time we hear about domestic violence, more time than often, the women who are, it's always women reporting that. Um, and one thing that I also, I think it's gonna be another way to, to switch the topic is to also talk about men that don't even report abuse from the wives or from the partner because we also have those instances where men don't report abuse because um it's as if um you are weak, you're actually weak as a man if you say my wife is abusing me so that would be another angle that we can take this thing what do you what's your thought on uh what are some of the signs would you say um women when you get the first call what do they usually say deputy ben ben <laughs> okay, so um, now the, the, uh, the, it, this is multifaceted. The, the the first thing is uh, when you go to a call itself, that's already different. That's something that has reached uh, the top part, like the the final part, and then now you're looking towards the consequences. Um, but the very first part from where it, it starts, um, sometimes it, it's hard for you to detect it. And those are the little things that goes by like, oh, my husband used to love me before, but he uh, doesn't love me anymore. Um, he doesn't give me as much money. In a case where the husband really needs to do that, um, the husband doesn't want you to keep um, the same links, maybe cuts you off from your family. And uh, you have, so it, it could be from any angle. It could be sexual. It could be the husband not caring if you're sleeping and wanting to make love with you at any time of the day or any time right of the night, regardless of, how much work you've done it could be financial um maybe the husband um wants to control all your finances or make sure you are always in a tight spot with in terms of finances and also let's keep in mind that the realities of domestic abuse in the u.s will sometimes be different from the ones in cameroon because there uh, there's different realities you know um, but there are all those little signs that you miss one very good indicator that i know is rarely do we see people escalating from verbal abuse to or escalating to a uh, physical abuse without passing through verbal abuse you always see ver verbal abuse is like a test ground um it reduce your, your self-esteem insult you insult your family to make you feel inferior so they first of all torture you with all these insults to lower your self-esteem and, and all those little things start cutting you off antagonizing you and everything before it goes to that rarely do you see just move from step a to physical abuse so when you start seeing all those signs and uh, there's there's got to be some recognition 
there's got to be some some steps to be taken, maybe trying to bring in family members. And uh, I know we haven't got into that part yet, but it's always good to have those family members that have some some authority over you and maybe even to a certain extent your, your spouse, people you can talk to, people who can place calls because these things do help and uh, don't let it escalate. Now, the other part, I think uh, Attorney James just touched it where it gets to the boiling point, the point where you usually call uh, uh, the law enforcement, the police or a sheriff um, office or something. Uh, that's, that's like the boiling point right there. And that's, uh, I'll call it almost a point of no return because when you actually call the cops on uh, either one of the spouse, um, male or female, whatever decision is gonna happen over there, it's like a point, it is going to have a lot of consequence on, on, on both couples. Uh, why, let me just pinpoint this in, in, in this aspect. Um, before, uh, when law enforcement, the orientation was that if maybe see the female or the male calls the cops, when they go there, um, they will have to make a determination of who is being, who is assaultive and who is like the victim, right? And then at some point, things started changing. They realized that, oh, females too were making all these fake calls just because they want to get the man in trouble. And then you had this new orientation in law enforcement where sometimes they'll go there, maybe not arrest anyone of the people because they are not very clear about who is the who is being assaultive. Another part is where they'll go there and arrest both parties. So that happens too. And then the third part is they started realizing now uh, you have to get one person. You have to do something because the, the worst thing that can happen to a policeman is you actually go to a call and then see all the signs. You see that it's weighing that this person is actually wrong. Then you say it's not very clear. You let it go. And the next thing you know, two days time, you receive a message that this person killed this person. Yeah. So it's going to haunt you forever, what you could have done and what you didn't do and all of that. These cases are complicated. Yeah. Yeah, they are, and then I, I don't want to take the microphone too much, but um, they are really complicated because in a case where the, man, the woman is just angry or upset and trying to exploit law enforcement because like here, we always say when the ones the people get here, they, they start knowing about their rights and everything. Some of those things that they didn't know back in Africa, some of those protections from law enforcement that they didn't have back in Africa, they know that they have all of that. And sometimes they take advantage of this. So you might have a normal domestic civil situation. And the woman is pissed off about so many other different things, but except physical violence is not one of them. Then they call the cops because they want to kick the man out of the house or kick them out of property or kick them out of everything. That is no and, and and that was gonna go into my next question. What are some of the evidence? Because, like you say, it's a tricky situation because you don't really, um, you don't know if somebody is just making things up to put somebody else in trouble. So, what are some of the um, evidence that either you know attorneys or law enforcement officer look at in order to determine if you even have a case? or if you, what you're saying is actually um, true. Okay. Um, James? Yeah, I okay, wanted to say something. <laughs> uh, you know, he's a police officer. I'm a defense attorney, right? So I represent the perpetrator, okay, in most cases, all right? Not the victims, okay? So this morning I had a victim come uh, because we were discussing, right? And of course, the police officer goes to the scene like uh, Deputy just said, and then after a while, they want to recant the story. That's another, that's, a, that's another big clue, okay, of someone who is suffering from domestic violence. Because they've called the law enforcement and the community is getting involved, and now she's aware of the consequences, right? She wants to recant. So the uh, perpetrator gets the attorney, the attorney gets the victim to come in. Again, another clue, like Deputy was saying, when they come in, you always know from experience, you see the controlling, the person who is controlling. Now, what do we do in my practice? I let, the, I let them talk. So, for example, the perpetrator will be like, well, she called the cops on me, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to jail. We're going to lose everything. I'm the provider, blah, blah, blah. blah. Okay? She will be like, yeah, I want to write an affidavit of non-prosecution. I want this case dismissed. Okay? But now... As an attorney and as a police officer, you have a duty to report domestic violence. Where there's domestic violence, you have to report. You cannot hide it. 
So when you separate them now, right? And you say, okay, fine, husband, step out. Okay, let me talk to her one on one and see what happened. That's where you learn a lot of issues. Okay, and the fear in Texas, especially in Houston, is the fact that tomorrow you will get that phone call that that victim or somebody got hurt. Okay, so like the one I spoke to this morning, she's a Cameroonian. She said, Well, guess what? I'm with him, he had been abusing me forever. Okay, and I did not want to leave because if I leave, they will say, Oh. I left the marriage, or they will blame me to be the person. Or like she said, they say in Africa, or oh, marriage means till death do us part, and now you have to stay there, all right? And she, are, in her mind, she's thinking that when this started, it was because they're going through that difficult phase, okay? But this, it's, it's, not, it's not right to hit somebody. Domestic violence is not good. Like in the Takam case, the woman ended up dead. Right. So what are some of the signs to domestic violence? Now, like we said, there are some people who fake it. OK, when the officer goes to the scene. Right. Some of them start crying and crying and being so dramatic. OK, some of them destroy their clothes and make it as part of the evidence. Some of them will take an instrument and cut themselves and say the perpetrator who did it. All right, but I'm not saying that it does not exist. It does exist, and sometimes you don't see the signs because if someone is dark in complexion, okay, and the officer goes there, and this person had been choked. Now, strangulation is a third degree felony. You're going minimum is two years, maximum is ten. All right. So we should. Okay, okay. Can you can you repeat that again so that people are just aware okay. of it? So there's an argument. Let me. There's an argument. You guys are shuffling. Right? Let me say the guy turns around and then grabs the woman by the throat right here, okay? And pushes her back, right? And she goes and she calls 911 and says, hey, we've been, we were shuffling and then this guy choked me, I could not breathe, all right? Immediately that officer comes to the scene and they pick you, the charge is a third degree felony and you're looking at two to 10 years. Now, would you, would you see any sign of injury? The officer will take pictures to see if there are marks on the neck. You understand? When the person is dark in complexion, you cannot see. But that person said, I got choked. Right? That's what the officer is going to go by. Okay, so. That's something that I think many, um, many of us um, immigrants, people who immigrated from Africa, we come here and we don't know that, right? Um, we, we, we perceive domestic abuse to be physical, I punch you in the face, um, I use a belt, I use this, I use that. And we don't have a concept of just even emotional abuse. I mean, it's even hard for me to have conversation sometimes with African men and talk about emotional abuse because th this is a concept that back home we don't even know that, you know, just, just um, verbally, um, insulting somebody, degrading somebody, um, financially restrict, restricting the person is make you actually being a, abused, an abuser. And I think this is a conversation that we should be having. Um, what you just said, I didn't even know those facts. The fact that you can just choke somebody without even punching them or anything and the person report um, to the police, that's two to 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, I know Mary in Cameroon is a whole different story. So do you <laughs> do you want to touch based on that? Well, you know, um, <laughs> in Cameroon, there's not much the law does as far as domestic abuse is concerned. So sometimes you don't even want to get the law involved. There's nothing like you call the police and they show up. You know, you don't call the police. You call the police, you're wasting your time. Even if you go to them, they'll be the first to tell you, go and work it out now. This is marriage. This is Africa. Uh, so you are really almost on your own, whether you are the man or the woman. Mm -hmm. I think the worst thing is even when you are the man, you cannot even go and report that. Like, it looks like you are no more a man. How can you say your wife abused you? When you are the woman, you want to go, your family will be like, how can you go and be exposing... Oh, if something happens, if they take your husband and stop. So before you even go and report, it has gotten to max. And in my case, I am a lawyer. I didn't go and report anywhere. I just left after six years. I left and I never even showed up in court when he filed for divorce. 
And of course, in my case, when I left, since he was the one who was able to say whatever, he said whatever. And I was not interested in, in saying something else. I wanted to first work on myself, heal, recover, and come back. Because when I left, I just left the country. And I stayed out for four years before coming back. So it is something that is, um, it takes a lot to get to the point where you, you cannot take it anymore. And then uh, to actually know what to do in Cameroon. We don't have the support of the law like out there, you know, two to 10 years. And I'm just like, wow. I've been looking at my penal code. I've been looking at my civil code. There's nothing there that specifically addresses domestic violence. I know that there was a family code that was drafted, I think, in 1981 when Yawa Isatu was Minister of Women and Social Affairs, and that code has not been voted into law up to today. Oh. And it's, so it's like, I mean, what are you going to say? Marital rape is not recognized by the law, so you cannot talk of sexual violence by your partner. You know, what do you mean by he degraded you? I mean, he paid your buy price. You are his wife, right? He humiliates you. What do you mean? He blames you. Those are small things. Deal with them. Uh, he screams at you. Oh, what else? I mean, he lies to you. He cheats on you. What is cheating? In Cameroon, what is cheating? I have a, I, I know a woman, uh, you know, she has stayed in America. They got married in America. And they came back and they were behaving Americanized. And the man cheated on her and she was so pissed off. And she said, I want to fight for divorce. Everywhere she went, they said, Ha, you're not going to get that divorce on the basis of cheating. Cheating, what is cheating? You know, come and tell us that he has beaten you and smashed you and stuff like that. Show us bruises, medical reports. Then we can start talking. But if you say cheating, uh, so I really think that it is not easy to prove. On that, on that same note, Okay, now a class oh, B, domestic. middle will be pain. Just up, out here, it's pain. So therefore, I had this one, this was, this was a very interesting one, okay? So wife, Nigerian, husband, Nigerian, they're all making good money. Good relationship, right? But the wife wanted the mother-in-law to come to uh, Houston and visit. So she was in the bathroom taking a shower. The husband goes in there and say, hey, I'm looking at the bank statement, right? Where did this $1,500 go to? She's like, oh, honey, uh, I used that fifteen hundred dollars to buy a ticket for my for 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 my mom to come. He was like, oh, sweetheart, this was a conversation now. Oh, sweetheart, why did you take that fifteen hundred dollars without telling me? You too. All he did was he took his hand, right, push on the jaw, and said, you too. She said, excuse me, because I think it had never happened before. They were married for 15, 20 years. It had never happened before. She immediately picked up the phone, not knowing what she was doing. Down the officer, the officer came. Guess what? Homeboy got picked up for family violence. All right? She had to move out of Texas and go to Atlanta for the case to be dismissed. Finally, the prosecutor gave him Class C, offensive touch. And he had to pay $200 fine and go take anger management and a beep class. Beep class means a battered spouse. All right? <laughs> And, 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 and you can see the difference. You can see the difference in. Yeah, we in, also, yeah. also need to understand that if you're not a U.S. citizen and you abuse somebody and you are charged with family violence, be it a class B, class B simply means the person said, I felt pain. And they pick you and transfer you to immigration, you are done because there's no bone for you and you are gone. It's done, it's over. So those are my concerns, you know, those are my concerns that we should, our community should be aware of it. And secondly, too, I want everybody watching in America to know this. If you are an African, okay, and you appear in that court, there is already a stigmatization against you, especially if you are male, okay? Immediately you stand and you open your mouth and the judge says, hey, if they suspect that you're a Nigerian, say, is he Nigerian, right? Trust me, trust me. You will be roasted. I guarantee you. I promise you. And they're just waiting for the moment to open your mouth. And they just see a sign of you trying to be authoritative. Okay? So please, please, let's be very, 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 very careful. According to the system, the original African men, quote, unquote, tend to be very aggressive. aggressive. They do not define what aggressive is, but they say aggressive. So please, 
I'm here to talk on behalf of the men. Let's avoid, if they're stigmatizing us as abusers, let's avoid it, right? We can take them to Cameroon and talk to them in Cameroon and take them to the village and talk to them in the village and let the village, let the village chiefs and the village heads do what they do best, put them in their place and tell them, you know, some things that they do are not right. Over to you. Yeah, and and and, and it's really interesting because Mary is explaining how the law in Cameroon, for example, doesn't it's not even applied. It's, it's not even taken into, into consideration domestic violence or rape. Um, so, and in the US, for example, the law does not give it, I mean, like you said, it actually profiled black men or African men because we already seen a, a, as aggressive. Um, in my personal experience, I have, um, friends that are that live in the US that are currently in abusive relationship. Um, but the problem is that more time than often they don't even know that the law is on the side. Because we 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 come here with the mindset, the African mindset that we're not supposed to report our husband, you know, this this is the father of your children if you guys have have kids. And the shame um from the African society is already on you. If the marriage fail, it's on you. If you report him, it's on you. It's as if um, the institution of marriage is actually bigger than your own life. So therefore, just stay in it and remain in it. So D Deputy Ben, what are, what um, is your take on that? Um, because I've, have you also noticed the same thing when it comes to what James was saying um, in terms of if you're already a black African man or a black man in general, that's already, you already stigmatize. Uh, very much so, very true. Um, I mean, it, there's a stereotype out there that um, African men are controlling and um, that we are very physical, especially when it comes to women. And um, <clears throat> uh, what, I, what I can say is that we should be a little bit smart and um, we should be smart in handling or going about our business with uh, our female, with our spouses. Um, I'll tell you a brief story. This guy, he's a white guy, one of my lieutenants. And um, he said one time, in, he, was, he was married, okay? He's in a second marriage. He was married and apparently he started cheating with, uh, cheating his wife with another person in the force still. So when the wife discovered that the wife, as, as he explained, the wife is a big, it's a big girl. So she's, you know, full bodied and everything. So he said, this man is a big man too. He said the wife gave him a serious beating. So the wife punched him, the wife kicked him, the wife did all kinds of things to him. And this man is a grown man and this man can, can fight back. This man can do so many things to that woman. But what he, he tried everything because he realized then that he already had a 23 year career in law enforcement. He realized that the wife was trying to trap him so that he can react and then she would do all kinds of things to herself to say that, hey, he beat me up. So he said, I had to take that beating. So he allowed himself to be beaten up by the wife. The wife gave him a serious beating. He struggled and escaped and then went to the police chief and said, you see all these things, you know, like white people, when something happens to them, you can see all the different colorations. And explained to the chief that you see all these things on me. It is my wife that did it to me. I did not touch her. I did not do anything. So if anything comes up, know that I didn't do nothing to her. He, he let this pass. And then the next thing he went and divorced um, that, that woman. And they moved on. They all living their separate lives. Now, why does this apply to African men? Because we have this Lion King mentality. Um, we think uh, everything has to boil down. If it doesn't work through conversation or otherwise, it has to boil down to us overpowering. And again, this is not only us, this is a lot of men, but I'm saying be smart. Don't try to prevent something by doing the exact opposite of preventing something. How do I, why do I say that? If you say, for example, you're trying to prevent your wife from cheating on you with some other man. Now, if you have your wife and beat up your wife, guess what's gonna happen? You're gonna be arrested. While you are in jail, guess who's gonna be doing stuff to your wife? The same person you try to stop, right? So why do you wanna stop somebody from being with your wife and then you go and do exactly something that's going to put you in a bad place. And will, while you are in jail, guess what? That wife is going to be the comforter. The same person will be comforting your wife. So in trying to stop that, you've prevented that. Guess one more thing. You've compromised yourself because when you get out of jail, 
you're coming out with a, a, a background, you're coming out with a criminal history. So if you were doing a good job, you just lost your job. You just compromise everything. You compromise your kids. You compromise even your relationship because if that wife didn't love you when you had a, a job, she wouldn't love you when you can have a, a better job. So just that act alone of getting violent compromises a lot of things. That's why I go back to that point. Be smart about it. Be smart. She wants to beat you up. She wants to cheat on you. Whatever she wants to do, one good way to, to, to punish her is to walk away. Say, hey, this is the vehicle. Take it. This is the house. Take it. This is everything. Take it. I'll walk away. If you go and use physical violence, you will compromise yourself, compromise your kids, compromise everything. You will never get back to the same state. You will never get back to the same state. So it is unwise. It's like shooting yourself in the foot. So that's all I can say. Let's be wise about this thing. And another thing, too. Please, if it happens that you have to hit her, please don't hit it when the kids are involved. Because if any one of those kids observe it, and the officer comes and says, hey, where did this happen? It happened in the kitchen. Where were the kids? The kids were there. Trust me. Once you guys leave from the family violence court, you guys are heading over to CPS. CPS is Child Protective Service. Okay? Somebody will lose custody. Either both of you or one person will lose custody. So like officer is saying, the consequences are just too much for you to waste your time, all right, to deal that you want to beat a rat. No, let the rat go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. You don't need all of that. Somebody from the UK just sent an e a text message saying that men in the UK are also being abused. We just want to say we had covered that earlier. And it's, it's see, in the UK, we have many new cases of men suffering domestic violence. It's not only the women. <laughs> so it's true. Yeah. And for some of those victims, let's say a story is actually true. Because I also, I, I, like, I want to speak on behalf of the victims, the women who are actually, the women or men actually suffering in those situations. What are some of the evidence that you guys need, um, uh, law enforcement need, in order to determine? Like, is is the simple fact of saying he touched me here, even though there there are no marks? Is it is it something that? you guys take into consideration and then um, the guy is already in jail or there needs to be more things, more proofs, more evidence. I And I'm saying just specifically because I had a friend who was going through domestic um, abuse and she kept on telling me, but I don't, how am I going to go and complain? I mean, first of all, she, she was, she's African. So I think you already have that layer of, um, of, of expectation that you're not supposed to even report your husband. But she was so concerned with the fact that the husband was somebody who was important. He was somebody who um, she felt had um, had a lot of friends in the in the judicial system. And you know, she's, she's just a stay-at-home mom. And the husband has um, friends who are lawyers, friends who are police officers. And the story can always shift, right? And she she kept on telling me, I don't know uh, what type of evidence I would need because this is the backup that he has. So in that instance, what are some of the things that you would say to a victim like that? Um, if, if you let me answer, I'll, I'll say a little bit of that. With the black skin, sometimes it gets a little bit complicated because uh, somebody can give you a, a, a nasty slap somewhere and it wouldn't really show. But um, I know this is one area where it, it all depends on the discretion of the officer. It's very, very important, especially in the, in the U.S., for the officer, the police officer to use his discretion, giving the summary of facts, the circumstances, how the call came through, uh, the emergency, what are the dispatch reported, what's going on, what's happening, you know, the voice and everything. You take all of that to consideration. Once they get on the spot, and I'll say this, say, I, I know fake when I still want. When somebody's putting up a show, maybe they are exaggerating. You can, you can pretty much tell. If they are being real, you can pretty much tell. But beyond all of that, which goes back to the discretion of the officer, there are some very basic things. Uh, we, the, I don't know if you say the five W's or something. Keep in mind like time, time frame. When did this happen? Uh, where on your body, where did he hit you? what location what area 
okay? Was there a witness? Was a kid in the room? Was something? All those things can come into play. Those very simple questions. Where did the person hit you? How many times did he hit you there? Is he still training? And then, you know, all those basic facts allow the officer to make a, a, a judgment on whether to take somebody in or not. And I promise you, if you're lying, people have tried it in the past a lot and they end up getting arrested. If you are lying, it will show. It's hard to put up a complete show to convince an officer. Now, other aspects they can look at is antecedents. You know, some things that have happened in the past. Maybe, maybe there's been a 911 call in, from that house. Oh, we went there. It's nothing. It's blah blah blah. And then maybe that's a third call. Okay. Now it alerts them that there is something going on here, and somebody's trying to hide it. You know, they look at all of that. And um, when the situation is light, they'll see it. If it's a serious beating, they will see it. They, they are trained and out of experience in answering many calls, they can determine uh, this is a case where if I turn my back and go and I just give the, a card to somebody, it might end up being a case where we return here and something more serious happens. So they, they know how to make use that little discretion. And uh, I can tell you a lot of times, a lot of times they get it right. And... Uh, uh, the main, like, one example James used was that uh, yeah, a little touch in the cheek. Unfortunately, we are in a country of laws. There's almost a law for everything in America. Uh, that was a touch. That's even more. Do you know that terroristic threat? <laughs> terroristic threat can still be in the same place. Just telling somebody that, um, you know I bought a gun last week, and you keep doing what you're doing, I will blow off your head. That alone, that's a terroristic threat, yes. If you say that just that alone without acting upon it, you will be arrested. If you say I will break your neck or something, that kind of threat, that's a terroristic threat. You will be arrested. So there is so many of those little things that uh, you can get arrested. Do you, do you need proof when in other or, or or can you just call? This is this is where it's it's messed up. And this is where the, this is where the men complain a lot because sometimes maybe what they think in the assessment does not amount to domestic violence or terroristic threat that they think is nothing i was just maybe bluffing amounts to something because the law is right there so a man can just say oh i just i just touched the head i did not even that's not even a slap but did you touch once you say yes guess what you're going oh i did not really do anything i just grabbed her hand i did not do it did you grab her hand Yes, that's domestic violence. So it, the, the way the law is, it's strictly like respect of the other person. You cannot do anything that's physical. We only talk about that there's also a false imprisonment. Say, for example, your wife wants to get out of the room. You say, we're going to talk about this matter today. You are not going anywhere. She comes, you, you, you push her back. She comes, you push her back. That's false imprisonment. You will go to jail for that. You, it's, it's the way it's going, so there's a law for almost everything. And which unfortunately works against a lot of people. Like we will say violence is not the solution because uh, it will really compromise a lot of things. Uh, there, there's a lot to lose. And I, and I love what you said because many, many people do not know those things that just making threat, verbal threat can actually put them to in jail just you know touching you even though it wasn't a slap but it was just a grab you know um can also you can also be put in jail for that yeah. so i let love the fact that like, a little bit let me make you guys laugh a little bit now so the wife is upset right the wife is already upset with you as a guy she's like okay you know what enough of this you keep coming back at this house at 2 a.m in the night you and your friends are drinking blase 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 she says, okay, fine. You know what? You say, man, you push her. She's like, okay, fine. Don't push me anymore. Don't push me. If you push me, I'll call the cops, right? She picks up the phone and she's dialing. Immediately she dials at 911. If you grab that phone, it's a charge. That's another charge. That's right. It's a charge with 911. Please. All of these things happen. And guess what? Even if the prosecutor decides to drop the assault, the domestic violence, because it has more consequences, right? They still got you for interference with the 911 call. You know there why? You because they will just call the operator and the operator will say, yes, while she was on the phone, I heard grab all over the phone. That's it. I didn't know that's that it. too. <laughs> um, Mary, I can see you. 
being so surprised the <laughs> your verbal <laughs> your facial expression i know in cameroon we don't have any of that you made it clear that even going to the uh to the law enforcement they would just look at you and say ma'am go back and figure out your marriage um but what are some of the ways do you believe that uh in cameroon we can actually help you have an association that takes that help um abuse women battered women what are some of the things that you in the ground what are some of the things that you think we can do to help those people who are actually victims of abuse well first of all it's not really only for women but the the truth is that it's women who come up more than men you know and uh, the men don't think that it is man enough to go and report in cameroon that i have been abused by my wife maybe in the u.s men do it maybe somebody said that in the uk we have more cases in cameroon very few even on social media on tv you don't sometimes and then before a woman beats up the man in cameroon i know that the man most cases the man has pushed her buttons to the extreme or has beaten her up very well and then she decided to beat up the man too so um as far as domestic violence is concerned in cameroon and as a lawyer i've been on this thing for since 2008 um because the law is kind of incapacitated, we try to um, see what we can do. Like, first of all, many people will come to me when there has already been irretrievable damage. But if people could start, you see the first sign and you kind of like bring it up, maybe you would fix things up, maybe you will leave at that point. And um, I don't know, but when people come, when it's already like, they can't take it anymore what we do is um help them see how prepared they are to move on and um, how prepared they are in their mindset to start on their own like chris takam was saying i can't start all over again well if you are really being abused and as a woman i'm talking for women you know you and you want to leave then you you just have to start all over again there is nothing in cameroon like you will leave and then the man will pay you any child support or nobody even if, if they say he should pay and i want to talk my parents separated so they, 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 they got a divorce and my mother did not even file for any early money or anything because other jurisprudence shows in this country they will not pay what are you going to do to them if they don't pay and you know that they can bribe their way out of anything so the, the thing here is just leave know that you are starting all over again what is your strategy and we try to work on those with with the victims you know so that they can move on but if it's to say oh the law is going to lock that man up two to ten years and pay twenty thousand dollars or whatsoever it doesn't work in this country it's going to cost you so much more to get that um, backing from the law yes counsel what I want to say is, I'm, I'm, I concur with what, but here in the U.S., there are some preventive measures that can happen. So, for example, if you're in an abusive relationship, you can always call the police officer, call the cops, go to see Deputy Ben, and say, this is what is going on through my, in my house, and you can get a restraining order, you can get a protective order, where they could say, okay, fine, hey, for 60 days, all right, you do not come to this house, okay? Now, if you step foot in that house, Trust me. You see, that's why I keep saying the consequences. Or if she changes her mind and she says, hey, let's meet at Starbucks, and you go meet her at Starbucks, trust me, you violated the law and you are gone. So there are very, there are protective measures, like he was saying, before getting to that escalation point, that you can do. You can go get a protective order, get a restraining order, Right, but remember, as you start going through that trajectory, right, you're building a case because what they call unadjudicated offenses, if you ever get convicted or charged for another one, all those cases that they have not been charged before, they're bringing an added on top of what you're being charged on. All right, wow. so all I'm trying to say here is before the men or the women leave Cameroon to come on Nigeria or whatever, right, be ready, change your mindset about the status quo of the relationship, how it is, okay? Because it's a society where they protect women a lot and women tend to be very, very, very manipulative because the system protects them. So, I mean, let me, let me not say that. 
both sides, both sides, both everybody turns to domestic violence. Everybody turns to you know be manipulative and be a be be be, a, be you know manipulative to, to hurt to be vindictive. So the consequence you, are too much. Yeah. Have you had cases where somebody filed charges, then they want to drop charges because maybe uh, they feel bad after afterward that my children. Um, they're not going to have a dad. Yeah, that's what officers hate. Officers cannot stand that. Hey, we, 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 as a I, defense attorney, that's, that we live by that. <laughs> hey, that that happens in like a, a lot of cases. I don't know what percentage, but it happens in a lot of cases because everything like is in the heat of the moment, you know. And I, I'm, it, it's so close to home. I have a fellow colleague. I, I work together with him. We go out in the streets and work together, you know. And I don't know, he went out to drink or something. And then um, the whole thing just escalated. When he came back home, he got physical. That's one of the most horrible things, escorting one of my colleagues, having him in handcuffs. Because when they call whoever is on, on, on patrol, when they get there, they have to make a determination who is being assaulted. And when it comes back, that is the husband. Oh, you're going down. So it, 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 the, the thing got stuck in my head. Now I have this other case where it is a friend, um, a Cameroonian. You know, she's she's married and everything, and then um, you know, she's been complaining, trying to get my standpoint from the law perspective. I am not one of those people, even from the standpoint of being law enforcement. I'm not one of those people that I think everything that happens, every little thing, you should call the police on your husband or your wife. I'm not one of those people. I try to look at solutions. Are you sure about this? Have you tried this? Have you tried that? Is there any way you can work things by? Is there any way you can work up things? My first advice is never for you to, to, to call law enforcement. Okay, but this friend, which I've known for so many years, uh, complained about this, complained about that. And I said, I, I, I told her, I said, look, because, yeah, she was about to call the cops. And I said, look, this is going to be a tough one for me, but you will have to make that final decision because once you do that, the case is no longer yours. When you report somebody to uh, to the police, the case becomes a criminal case the, between the state and that person. So you, the woman, whatever you say, you want to recant, you want to change the story, it doesn't matter. Except maybe you want to state a story that, hey, I was lying, and that's going to be another case against you. So if you say, I'm sorry, it did not really happen that way, blah, 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 I, two things. You're either lying, which means another case against you if you're not careful or something. So anyway, going back to that story, I told this person, I said, look, you will have to make that decision because I don't want to feel guilty for another person's place. But the other thing I want to say is that I don't want you to sit back and don't do anything. And then one day we hear that your man killed you. So, but guess what? She finally made a decision and called the cops. Uh, he was taken. And then um, the, the case went on. And then obviously the same pressure from people, family members. How is it going to look like? Are you really going to send me to jail? Are you going to compromise my career? Then she was the same person spending again to try to bail the man out. You see how it works? So it is, the, the entanglement is too much. That's why it's important for people to try to uh, uh, fix things in a way that it doesn't get to that boiling point where maybe the man will lose everything and consequently the, he breaks down the family structure you know so this this is a very uh it's, it's a very complicated thing you know you just add a little bit more to that so when the complainant the victim comes now and writes the the call an affidavit of non-prosecution okay at that time it's at the discretion of the prosecutor all right whether she's going to accept it or not because like the constable said at that time, or like the deputy of deputy said, at that time it's the state of Texas versus the perpetrator. Yeah. So now, when you want to do an affidavit of non-prosecution, it goes way, way, way deeper. Let me tell you guys why. Because within the district attorney's office, there is a specific unit staff just waiting to handle family violence cases. So what do they do? Let me say the husband, the community has put the pressure. Right? She writes the affidavit. She takes it there. The person in that department will say, come, 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 come. See, we've been receiving this stuff a lot. Everybody recants, recants. Sit down and watch this video. So they give her a video to watch. 
of the consequences of going through domestic violence, right? So she's cut in between, right? Now, well, this is where they fail. They've already told, I mean, Americans, Americans are very honest people. They'll come back and they'll tell the defense attorney that, look, man, you see that affidavit that she signed, right? She told us that the community was putting her under too much pressure. So guess what? I'm not going to dismiss it. I can do something else. I'm not going to dismiss it because she's a victim. She's just scared. Yeah. Okay? She's just scared. So the pressure on her is both ways because the state also comes on her and say, hey, are you okay? Do you need services? Okay, because everybody does not want, like the, like the officer said, the next day to see a dead person. Okay, now if you want to recant, also there are consequences too of recanting. You recant and you implicate yourself that you lied to an officer, you have a charge coming against you. So the best thing to do, avoid it, avoid it, avoid it. It's not worth it. It's not so, worth so, it. So basically, there's no turning back. Uh, Mary. Yeah, well, you know, now listening to uh, my two colleagues, because we are all of the judiciary, right? I, I now look at the Takam case and I'm like, probably this lady couldn't even recant. Maybe, maybe she tried because I gather there had been some pressure. The man came to Cameroon to talk to the family and they said, no, don't do that. We don't do that in Africa. But the case was already there. And then I even hear yeah, she's not even the one who kind of reported the domestic violence or fight for divorce initially. She was, her supervisor kept seeing the, the bruises and everything. And one day she said, no, this is too much. I'm going to call, uh, you have to report this. And so, you know, when a woman or anybody has been traumatized and abused, and as um, the deputy said, and I, I know in my own case, it doesn't start physical. So your self-esteem, everything you are like, you are lost. And so sometimes it's like, let me just go fight for this divorce. Let me just call. You don't think, hey, what are the repercussions of that call? But once you have made that call, you have made the call. And so you cannot recant because even if you write that affidavit of non-prosecution, they can decide not to, to, to throw it out or close it up. And so they can also decide to give you so custody because of all the evidence you have brought up. Whether you wanted joint custody or not, it's not more your discretion. They can decide to award anything based on how much the man is any. So when people say, oh, she was greedy and stuff, it's sometimes like that is not even what may have happened. And when I listen to them, I'm like, maybe she didn't even have so much of a say anymore in the outcome of that case. Wow. And, and we don't really know the specifics, right? Yes. Uh, we don't, we, we're just going off of uh, what other people said. Um, the people that were interviewed, even in Cameroon, some of the friends that were interviewed, the dad that was interviewed. Um, but all I know from those statements, um, so allegedly she she was somebody who was working and at the same time going to school. And even after the separation, right, he still had to visit his children. And, you know, I, I'm not sure how that comes into play when people separate. But I, I, I know they have visits, right? They have to go get the kids. So if the husband is not, I'm not sure, because we were talking, Mary, a um, couple hours before, and you were saying, but if there was a restraining order against him, why would he go to the house and pick up the children? Because they, he supposed, so I'm not sure exactly the specific. Um, Attorney James and Deputy Ben, I'm not sure if you guys know the specifics, but. It's, it was just, I wanted to make this video because for me, I feel like many of us, African immigrants, people who are immigrating to the U.S., make this mistake. Many of us are making this mistake of, oh, I used to slap her in Cameroon. So when I come in the, in the U.S., I was still slap her. And yeah. we don't know the repercussions. We don't know the consequences. We don't know that just, and, and that's why I like the fact that you were talking about even just verbal trait it's already there's already a charge for that and i think um and i hope that many people who are watching this video and who know people who are in those circumstances can already be like no um be careful what you say to your wife or be careful what you say to your husband because that can go against you in the future um so on that note in cameroon for <clears throat> for example um I'm not sure how to, because this is something that I also have friends in Cameroon and family members in those situations. And I've always wondered, 
if you don't have the law on your side, um, if you don't have a support system, a family member who are on your side, how do you even start? Like, how do you go from there? Um, except because, of course, you have association organizations that take care of those women. But more times than often, what I found is that the women, even though they leave, they go to the to the parents. They still have to go back to the children, right? Which means they still have to go back home, and the cycle continues. The cycle of, of abuse continues. So, what would you say to those women? And James and Ben, you guys can actually join in. For some of them, where the law does not apply, what would you say? And there also has to be a system in which we hold men or women, you know, the abuse that we hold them accountable. So what are some of the things that we can do in societies where the law are not really in place to protect these people? Unfortunately, in Cameroon, we don't have a hotline, you know, a national hotline. You know, it's just any association has their own number. We are trying our best. Um, I don't know of any credible domestic violence shelter in this country i know a few people who have a few things um, around the place but um i also used to receive people in my home right but how can i do how much can i do so i focus on children but um i'm thinking of raising funds to build a center or to open a shelter because when you are abused and you really want to move forward you have to first of all get to a space a place where you can calm down you can really think and then you can you can look at ways together with some professional help of how to pick up pick up the whatever the pieces and what you can do moving on because if you just leave and then you just move on into another relationship it can just be abusive all over again but uh, i really earnestly wish that there could be no abuse in the first place and people can do that because i don't abuse my children i don't and they've grown up and people are like oh man we are parenting and all of that and uh, tomorrow these children i don't see them abusing other people because they didn't grow up in an abusive home so i think sometimes it just it starts right from the foundation and we may want to think about the solutions uh, legally and all of that but what about even looking at the root cause and saying what can we do to even prevent abuse in the first place. first place look yeah in america in america you have all of those laws so you as you were saying when you come to america change your mindset mm -hmm. why not even change the mindset in cameroon must you abuse must you slap must well, you insult yes I, I think i think when i visit cameroon these days i see a lot of billboards with signs talking about domestic violence and it not being good i think that's one format i mean i, I see it all over i think that awareness is coming up all right, yeah, bit, by bit, bit by bit. I think we should go to the parliament. We should go to those parliamentarians, those senators, and say, okay, you know what? Hey, everybody has rights here. Everybody, women, men got to be protected. All genders got to be protected, okay? Mm -hmm. We need to leave the old boys' school system, all right, and come to a new era where we respect everybody. The fact that you go and you pay dowry does not mean that that person is your asset. Okay. Say, oh, wait, wait, wait. Say it again because <laughs> I want people to understand that <laughs> that the fact that, that because because human beings are not are not objects that you can buy and this is a tangible asset. This is yours. You do whatever. So, so say that. Say yeah, that again. If sorry, yeah. I mean, if you go and you pay a dowry on somebody, it does not mean that that person is your property. That person is your chattel. No, it's not. It's a human being. You have no right to turn that person into your slave. Like someone te text on, uh, on, over here. The person said, love, all right, is not yeah. domestic violence. If you love somebody, you will not do it to the person. Let it, yeah. let it go, let it go. The consequences are just too much. But I think in Cameroon, there's a better support system. People can go to their church members. People can go to elders in the community and talk to right yeah um, on, on that note mary i want to ask you about that because sure i mean i know you have a lot to say about churches when <laughs> you haven't said anything though let let the deputies chip in before i say something <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, uh, support support system is very is very is very very important. And I just want to acknowledge I saw some uh, text popping up. Um, somebody, I think Louise, I was talking about what evidences you can have. Uh, yes, with Unicase corroboration. Um, true. Um, if you can text somebody about almost every other thing, you can sure text that one or two people that you trust about uh, things not going on very well in your relationship uh, to keep a trace, uh, you know, keep that traceability. I mean, even if you don't uh, text, you can always talk to somebody that this is what's happened, this is what's going down, I'm afraid, and stuff like that, just in case uh, should things develop otherwise in the future. You have maybe one or two people that can step up and say, yes, I was a witness. I can remember three months ago or 11 months ago, uh, this happening. And uh, I just want to touch up on somebody. It's true. The, the bottom line of all of this, uh, so much comes into a relationship. It could be financial. It could be a lot of other things. But the bottom line is love. When um, when that love is not there, that's one of the main precursors. That, that brings up all of, all of the other aspects because... Uh, when, when, when love is away, everything else, you know, can come into play, and all of that is true. Um, but again, uh, support system. Every couple, I think, should have uh, that one elderly person or a level-headed person, whether no, no matter, regardless of the age, whom they can always talk to, who can, you know, rain down some of the feelings, who can make that, uh, you know, that family visit and say, uh, you know, talk to the people. Uh, we've done this sometimes between ourselves. Nobody's perfect. We 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 have this support system between friends. You have friends who tr who you trust, who can look at your spouse and talk to your spouse, and who can look at you and tell you the truth that you're wrong, you're right, and you know make you understand it, it, this is the right way forward. Or this is, so that support system is very important. In the U.S., in Cameroon, in Canada, in the U.K., that support system. You shouldn't have a marriage or a relationship in isolation. That already in itself it's trouble you cannot be in a marriage where you don't have people you can really really you know see about things that are going on because the bottom line is every family has something that's going on so you cannot be ashamed and yes and look at a situation where you're you're going to lose your life because you're ashamed to open up to somebody talk to somebody now before i finish up there's this other thing like here in the u.s um as far as like documenting things and all of that everybody that's here in the u.s keep in mind there's not only a 911 numbers to call when it gets to an emergency. Every police department, every sheriff's office, every law enforcement agency has what they call a non-emergency number. So the non-emergency number is very simple. I cannot give you all the list. Every state, every area has its own. If you are looking at something that doesn't feel right, doesn't look right, doesn't look good, and you have articulable facts of something developing, you can always Google. Uh, what is uh, this Houston Police Department on emergency number? What is um, uh, Dallas City or something like Police Department on emergency number? Now, what happens is when you call this emergency a non-emergency number, you can actually tell your story. Hey, I am this, this person. Uh, I live right here. I am in this kind of situation. I feel like sometimes I'm under some kind of threat or something is going on. I'm afraid that sometime he's going to put his hands on me. Once you make that call, you have this communication. The person that's over there is taking notes. So should anything come up in the future where you need to actually die 911, you already have a track of something that's going on. That is not the same as maybe taking the person to calling 911 for the person to get arrested. But once you get to that point, you, you, you're being afraid. You Just Google the non-emergency number. You're going to talk to somebody. They will listen to you. They will write down everything. So, and I believe this applies to um, a lot of places in the Western world, Canada, and all of that. There's, you can always, if you if you're done talking in your family circle, you can talk to law enforcement without calling nine one one. You can actually tell your story to them. And I just wrote it down because I want people to actually um, make sure that they do that because many people don't even know that that's an option. Um, that you can call that number and before he escalated to 911. Um, so, James, there was a question. I'm not sure if uh, I think we. There Jenny, is. Yes. I did not talk about um, going to the church or going to <laughs> yeah, that in community. I wanted um, 
pay to finish in Cameroon because I'm in Cameroon. Um, the proliferation of churches has just made it worse. Like you don't even know which one is real, which one is not real. All of them are trying to make ends meet. Some people even think that they are now businesses. And so when you go to them, they're looking for how to, to sap you out. And then the, the, the only way, one of the ways they do it is not the only way. I'm talking from experience. I also got very involved in one of them for a few months. And I know the kind of dynamics that goes on in there. They, they make you know that it's the Bible. That is what God wants. And so you just have to pray. You know, we actually do prayers for people to get husbands. So if you have prayed and done some fasting and prayed, 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 prayed to get a husband, you finally get one and then the one is abusive. That, that, how can you go back to that same church to say that husband I prayed for is abusive? What do you want that church to tell you? Secondly, that, that man can equally go to that church, uh, the pastor, and tell the pastor, oh, don't mind what she's saying. Now, you know how sometimes they don't want to submit as easily as the Bible says they should submit? So, and they would tell that that pastor himself is not also being abusive. I'm talking, you know, so sometimes seriously, when you have gotten to that point, you can't take it anymore. Going to the church is the last place or the worst place to go to because they're just going to tell you, this is what the Bible says. As um, James said, for better or for worse, the dead was part. So that's just the for worse. What are you talking about? Can't you just bear that? Can't you just understand he's stressed up with the pandemic? Can't you just... <laughs> so, so what about the social challenging. services? Well, Mitch, what huh? about the Ministry of Social Services? Are they not there to handle stuff like that? Ministry of Social Affairs and Social Services? I have not been in this country. Why are you putting it to me now like you don't know what happens in this country now? <laughs> <laughs> you want to hear that from my own mouth? <laughs> I, look, I once wrote to them in 2018 about a case. I have followed that case up until even in court. I have started it. I have started a divorce case and six months after it was finalized. That social service, I wrote to them for a case in 2018 and we are in 2020. I've given up. So, look, those things like that now, it's just, the best thing is just work on yourself, you know. Either avoid the abuse altogether or if you are the victim and you, you are really ready to move on because some people will, can come and say, we want to move on, I can't take it anymore, and then the pressure from their families or they themselves think about it, moving on to where now, how am I going to start again? I'm old and the children and stuff. And then three days later, they're, they're going back until yet they're dead. There's a man who killed his wife in Limbe in 2018. The case was all over social media. He kept beating her. She kept going, and then she kept coming back. They had five children. She's dead. And nothing happened to the man. He's dead. It's, it's, it's one of those things that you don't even know where to start because when you're dealing um, in nations, Af mainly African nations, where the law is not even applied um, and the perpetrator can just walk free, you know? Um, I know cases in Cameroon, actually, where the woman even tried to run away and he found her and brought her back home and continued the abuse and wherever she went he will find her and the police and i remember she told me she had called the police um last time i had talked to her she had called the police uh she went to the to the gendarmerie, à la gendarmerie to file a a complaint and she went to she kept on going from one friend to another because she wanted shelter and she could not find a safe a safe place. So it's, it's, it's really one of those things, like the support system in a place like Cameroon where the law is not really on your side, it, it's really key. And sometimes I find also that the families are the ones that actually push you to go back to the abuser, right? Um, marriage is not easy you have to take it you know you have to submit you have to do this and those those people are just there you know they're just coping with it um and that's why i'm always any any time i have to talk to somebody who's back home it's hard for me to say go and report go and file a complaint 
because I know it doesn't work. So, but what what do you really say to them? You know, and that's why I was so happy to have you on here because I felt like maybe there's a way we can help. Maybe in creating and building organization association that actually um, that is a safe place for them. Um, and have somebody who say people need to be educated on the importance of seeking help back home. Um, it's a true statement, um, but sometimes help is not easy to find. So what are some, what is the step? I know you guys, um, James um, and Deputy Ben, you talked about um, the, the different cases in which people can be charged. So if somebody filed for, if, if somebody actually make charges against the partner, um, or he slapped me, he, he punched me, he, he had verbal threat, what are some of the, and I know every case is different, but what are some of the steps that they have to go through? And how long does it even last? For example, in case of domestic abuse, is it something that stays for two years, three years? Um, what are some of the steps and how do they should they get started on that all right i, I, oh, I also want to ask a question about the people who do not have the means to actually afford a lawyer okay let me say something about i think uh attorney james will have a lot more to say about it now uh, especially like here in the us the laws uh, are not good for people um that are abusing their relationships um the very first thing if you are a man say living in your own house with your wife and you somehow they make the determination that you're an abuser uh, firstly you can very well expect that once you get to jail and then somebody bails you out after two or three days you are not returning back to that house that's the first difficulty imagine that you've been comfortable in your own house and that you're getting out of jail and then the, 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 the judge gives you that small pink paper, the things you can do, the things you cannot do. And one of the things they will tell you is that don't go close to that person within this distance. So you cannot even go back to your house. So you have to get law enforcement, your lawyer or some law enforcement to come and stand by for you to be able to access the house and pick up your little clothes and come out of the house. So you are not going to the house because it's a domestic violence case. You're not going back to the house. The second thing is not only that physical aspect. You are not allowed to contact that person by any kind of abusive text message or something like that. You cannot even insult the person anymore. If you insult that person by text message, you use a curse word, bitch, or whatever, then they will take it back again to, to the court. And next time you get back to that courthouse, they will, not, they will not be smiling on you. So I just wanted to point out those two things. Okay. That's why earlier on I mentioned that when you call 911, that's the point of no return. It would change things forever. Think that you are with your husband. And as soon as you call, if they arrest him and take him to jail two, three days, they bail him out, he cannot even return to the house again. He cannot contact you by text message. He cannot call you and shout you. Everything changes like within the hour. And it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt the wife. It's going to hurt the kids. It's going to hurt the whole family setup. That's the point of no return. So I think I'll leave those just those two aspects that I wanted to point out, those very basic things. And this is the other aspect. Let me just touch on that. I don't think we have too much time. The other aspect is uh, here in the U.S., a lot of jobs, a lot of places. The one, no, 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 the one place where they'll kick you out is if you ever say, yes, I have been accused or I have ever had any domestic abuse charge. You cannot work in most government agencies you cannot have a good job. I don't know of at very few places that will ever accept to work with anybody that has checked the box that, yes, I have ever had any domestic abuse case. So it, it's a point of no return. There's, there's just too much to lose. But just again to repeat, if you do that little thing right there and then they call you going, you're not returning back to that house. That house now belongs to that woman. You cannot even curse her on the phone. You cannot text her because you will spend more time in jail. Um, so. Um, Attorney James, um, I was asking the question for some of those victims that do not have the means, the financial means to actually afford the lawyer. What are some of the options that they have? Uh, they have non-profit organizations that um, they can contact. <clears throat> it's all about the place. For example, you have to take the Lone Star State, uh, Lone Texas Lone Star. There are a lot of places where you can go to. 
like he said, when you call the uh, police station, they will give you, they will give you, uh, they'll give people those numbers. Okay, so nobody is left behind. Everybody got somebody that um, you know got that that will be able to help. Now, just talking about the consequences. Okay, the worst thing that can happen to you is you get charged with a case of family violence. If you want to know, if you want to see the dark side of the U.S., right, and you end up in prison, that's where you will learn what, what they give to you as prison term, right? It's not what they're going to do to you in there, what the inmates, the brothers are waiting for you. Because the day you step in, the brother who has been there asks you, bro, what brought you in? Said domestic violence, what did you do? I hit on my girl or I hit on my kid. Oh, really? All right, I've been here 10 years. I haven't seen my kid. I haven't seen my wife. And what did you just do? All right, you know what you become? You become his real, real property. All right? You, you, he's over you at that time. So your body, your ass is his ass. I'm sorry, okay? Your food is his food. He hasn't had sex in a long time. You're going to become his partner. All right? And you have no choice. If you think that you're going to go call the warden for the warden to come save you, no, no. So the consequences are just so, 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 so much that you don't even want to think about it. That's the, that's the worst crime that you can do in the States. That somebody, even another criminal, will say, boy, what I did is not by what you did. It's not good. You don't mess with a kid, you don't mess with a woman. Don't touch a woman. Jess, let me just add something. You'll be very you'll be very surprised if I tell you this. I have seen people that walk sometimes in jail with a lot of pride when they kill somebody. Listen to this. I know, like from our background in Cameroon, when, when you kill somebody, they look at it like that's the worst thing on earth. If you, for example, you abuse a child, like sexually abuse a child, okay, you are worse. Listen, you did not kill the child. You sexually abused the child. Your case is worse in jail than somebody who actually pulled a gun and killed somebody. They look at like, that's nothing. So you actually killed somebody. That's nothing. Nobody goes after you. Nobody cares about you. But say somebody in jail understands that this man right there sexually abused the child. Just, just think about it. Just internet pornography. Just internet pornography alone. Uh, child pornography on online so, yeah that that is even worse than are you killing somebody so uh yeah. like james again said the, the consequences are just too much and, and 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 on and on that note i i recently i was talking to a friend of mine and she said something and maybe james you can you know give me more more clarity on that she said even the simple fact of sharing um child pornography on your phone you know how people send whatsapp videos they transfer whatsapp videos and she said even the simple fact of you having that video on your phone even though you did not click on it the simple fact that somebody transfer a child pornography on your video it's already you you can already be charged for it is that something that just to we're talking yeah. about um children he has, here. he has talked about that a lot in our main because we have our main groups I mean, okay. we belong to the same male groups. And he has been talking about that a whole lot. And every time, and people are not listening to him. Trust me, if the officer ever stops you and grabs that phone and that image of porn comes, trust me, of a child. <laughs> okay. Well. Hey, Jim, let me add one surprising one, okay? <laughs> I was I was doing some, a little bit of, I did not even know that one because the one that maybe they sent a video about maybe child pornography, that one is pretty clear. Uh, videos, all, all those ones are pretty clear. Did you also know in the new uh, laws that came up, uh, house bills that recently came up in Texas, in the state of Texas, if you send somebody a picture with a man, like a man you're standing and you have an erection, and you can tell, so your private part is not showing, but your pen is like bulging out, and you can tell the man has an erection. If I send that kind of photo to you, James, that's a, 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 a quasi misdemeanor. See. Just sending you. So, a so on the video on the child pornography, do I do the person? Let's say I receive it. Do if I click on it because it was it was uh, we were debating about that. Um, just 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 when and I. Does it matter if I click on it or if I did not? If I deleted it, um, does it matter? Okay, 
you clicked on it. I think James might have a better answer. But this is the thing. If somebody sends something to me which I did not solicit, I did not ask you to send me that, it's on you. You send it to me, it's on you. Now, when I keep it on my phone, it's in my phone. I haven't sent it to nobody else. I don't know what kind of trouble you get by keeping it on your phone. But keep in mind, if, say, by any means, you have some kind of investigation, some kind of issues where you're browsing, it goes online, and then they track you down, and then they realize that on your phone, you have child pornography. Every one of those videos, if you have 10 videos, is going to count like 10 cases of child pornography, 10 different yeah. counts. So if one count of child pornography is two years in jail, you are facing 20 counts of child pornography, just multiply two years by, 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 by 10. So that's how serious it is. Uh, but key thing is... Mary, mm -hmm. Mary do you? Yes. Yeah, um, I, I want to go, but I want to um, say that with regards to that Anis case or Takam's case, I think that giving all what I've heard, Chris really knew that he doesn't stand any chance at life anymore. So it was better for him to just take his own life out and than to go and rot in jail and go through all of that. Maybe, you know, so maybe that is why um, another man did the same thing in Nigeria, mother, the mother of his children and then um, Kate himself. Maybe that is why the guy did it in Boya, stabbed the girl to death and stabbed his own self too. Because even though in Cameroon, the law is not on your side, when he gets fatter, that is mother and capital mother. I mean, you have something, it's 20 years of life imprisonment, but you definitely have uh, of something. But we don't want it to get to that point where people have to be killed. That's the whole point of the conversation. So as um, somebody said, I think it's Hillary Eben, he said prevention is the best. And I think that is why the men sometimes don't like when the women come to America and they start being so informed and then start saying, well, this is my right, I'm going to call. Because when they say don't call, so why do you even have to put her in a situation where she may have to call? So don't slap, don't do that, don't even say that, you know, can you just talk without doing that? Can you just talk with a nice tone? Can you just look at the reasons for the conflict and talk like two people sit, talk? Why do you have to raise your voice? Anger management classes are for what? If you think you have an anger management problem, go and take an online course. Some of them are even for free. Don't right. abuse somebody and then when the person is abused, now people start saying, oh no, but this and that, no. So that is also something we are trying to do. Like I'm preaching, I personally am an advocate for peace, especially in relationships. I do a lot of talks and all of that. We can live in peace and harmony. And there's some men. My next book is going to be on positive masculinity. We there's some men, and I think even the few women who abuse, those women are broken women already. And then they take the least thing the man does and think it's such an attack, and so they have to defend themselves, and that's abuse. We can really do much better. So that's my last word. Uh, my battery is so down and I have to go. No, I've been in this room for thank like four you. hours. Thank you so much for making the time. Can you tell people where they can reach out to you? Well, my website is www.hopeforabusebatter.com and me, myself, I'm at www.mariabanga.com. Mariabanga.com is much easier. You can reach out to me. There's even a WhatsApp button. So you can reach out to me and just send me a WhatsApp. You know, um, I do a lot, you know, and I'm just hoping I get more partners so we can really build some structures and do much more. Yeah. Thank you so much, colleagues, but I have to go. It was nice meeting you. Thank you. Bye. 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 And guys, if you, for some of you who are in Cameroon, um, I have all her information in the description down below. If you want to check out her website, um, I also have her WhatsApp number if you guys want to reach out to her and her association. Um, so, gentlemen, are there any last words for, I, I, I was, I really wanted to cover everything. Um, for some of, you know, the people who may not know what the law is and how they can be protected and some of those perpetrators who don't actually who do not actually know that just the simple fact of just having a verbal threat can also be a charge against them do you have any last word for my audience before we just wrap up everything and 
there's somebody who asked, can you tell us what are the different outcomes for the children custody of that of that dead couple right now? Oh, is the oh, eighteen year old is well, the eighteen year old brother can the eighteen year old brother take his uh, other brothers as dependent? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. There's, it's going to be a battle. The state is going to get involved. Yeah. They're going to appoint a guardian. So yeah, the state is going to get involved. If they have an immediate family member here, immediate family member, and more than likely the kids will go stay with that aunt and the government will supervise. If they don't, then some other person is going to raise the kid. That guy, that guy is only 18 years of age. He still has his life. All right. It will be very, very, very tough for the court to give him custody of the siblings. Okay. So but yeah. if you have an immediate family, the immediate family can uh, be be given the appointed as a ward. Yeah, you, you, yeah, I mean, it's going to be like James said, it's going to be hard for uh, the 18 years. I don't think the 18 years needs that. 18 years old, you're still not even allowed to drink alcohol, you know, yeah. even though you are, you can vote, but you're still not allowed to drink alcohol. So you're still uh, just getting out of being a child. So uh, definitely some of that person is going to be the custodian. And uh, the, the other one thing I wanted to say as we're trying to depart is that uh, uh, to the men, especially when once you cross the oceans and you get here, as much as it is, let's try to adapt to the culture um because the culture is set up in a way that the men can almost feel in a certain way like they have it against them like the legal system has it against them but at some point it's a question of adaptation um the tendencies we have in in africa to be uh, the superior being over lord over the, the female it's not exactly the same thing right here and uh one word for the women will be uh, simply that uh stop for those that do that, stop trying to take advantage of every law in the book. You know, just because you have this uh, bad feelings going on in the family and you have options to fix things, to make things right. And you sometimes you choose the easy route to kick the man out of the house, out of the property to, to ruin his life. Because when you play something that's not, uh, that's not, that's not good, it basically ruins the man's life. And then that's where the frustration starts. Um, I mean, this is a topic that cannot end, but I think um, basically everybody can understand we can do better that's for it for the consequences the consequences of a conviction of a domestic violence you know it's just too much so to me the easiest thing for you to do as a man i'm talking about men right now mano a mano just walk out bro all right yeah walk out you are more of a man walking out all right than facing the consequences of domestic violence. If you came here to have your dream, you have family members back home, think about them. Just take that one second. Ask yourself, is this right worth it? If that right is not worth it, bro, move on. Okay, because the consequences are just too much that the abuse, the consequences outweigh the abuse. Yeah. Okay? So the consequences outweigh the abuse. There's no justification because if you're going down, trust me, from the judges. Don't, I don't care if the judge is a Democrat. From the judges. The minute you walk in their courtroom, it's no longer you. That person takes over you. And so they, they, they impose their own values. Okay, for example, a judge is a judge that's running against domestic violence. I guarantee you, okay, that judge will make sure that you fail because he will use that as an example for the campaign. Mm -hmm. Prosecutor is there. The prosecutor already got her own personal biases. So regardless of what you do, okay, the system is already stuck against you. There are people behind the scenes that you don't see that are talking to your wife, convincing her not to drop the charges because tomorrow she will end up dead. So please. And then if you're not a citizen, okay, you still have immigration waiting for you. All right? So please. The consequences just far away. They are beautiful. Yeah, you move on. You will find another partner that will love you and treat you like being a man or a woman, bro. You still gonna get some love, peace. Yeah, thank you, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. One Thanks. one takeaway from this conversation is that, um, as already just the skin color in which you show up is already against you because you already perceive as you know aggressive if you're an african man so for some of you who are watching i hope this interview this conversation was really insightful if you have any further questions or if you want to reach out to those amazing people that i have on here 
Um, the information is going to be in the description down below. Um, if you have any question when it comes to law or when it comes to where can I get help, once again, every information is going to be in the description down below. Thank you all for watching. Thank you guys for Thank you. being here. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Mm.